Uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and sure. what you do here at SICE. Well, my name is Ruth Wedgwood. I'm a professor of international law and diplomacy, according to my title, at Johns Hopkins University, uh, which has a school of foreign policy, the School of Advanced International Studies in Washington near DuPont Circle. Uh, before that, I was a professor of international law at Yale for about 15 years. Uh, before that, I was a prosecutor for about eight years uh, in New York City and in Washington with the federal government. And before that, I worked clerk for the Supreme Court for Harry Blackman and the Second Circuit Court of Appeals for Henry Friendly. Yeah. Okay. And so when you look at the, um, the legal uh, argument that the United States put forth to the United Nations, can you kind of characterize how it works and kind of explain it a little bit? Which, which legal argument? Uh, the legal argument for, I'm sorry, with the, in regards to 687 and 678 and the legal argument that was put forth uh, in terms of the uh, uh, justification for going to uh, uh, the liberation of Iraq. Well, the, most often the U.S. government, Democrat or Republican administration alike, doesn't issue white papers. You don't see big, thick law review articles coming out of the legal advisor's office at the State Department. Rather, they either have presidents give speeches or there are speeches in the Security Council or there are actions uh, that are commented on later by commentators. So it's hard to, again, say there's a single theory for doing something in, in, in any case, whether it's the action in Kosovo under uh, President Clinton or the uh, invasion of Grenada under President Reagan or the invasion of Panama under Bush the father. Uh, so there's no single, there's, there's no single white paper you can point to as the theory. Um, I think, to my mind, the most persuasive argument uh, for Iraq on the weapons side was the multilateral project that the UN had in tow from 1991 on. If you read what Saddam's people used to like to call the mother of all resolutions, which was Resolution 687 from March of 1991, it set various conditions that Iraq would have to meet for a ceasefire, for a durable, uh, essentially permanent ceasefire at the end of the Gulf War. Because don't forget in 91, uh, the Allies took the decision not to go to Baghdad. And at that time, the decision not to go to Baghdad was kind of romantic. It was the hope to, that you could show that you didn't have to conquer a country. You didn't have to seek unconditional surrender. You didn't have to have a replica of Germany or Japan in order to accomplish the purposes of a, of a limited war. Rather, all you wanted out of it was to defang Saddam so that he wouldn't threaten his neighbors anymore. He wouldn't harm the Kurds. And, any additional circumstances. So 687 set the conditions for that, and it said that Saddam, uniquely among all leaders of the world, Iraq uniquely among all countries of the world, had an absolute obligation not to acquire weapons of mass destruction, biological, chemical, nuclear, uh, nor any ballistic missiles uh, with a range above 150 kilometers. And those were very serious conditions, very seriously thought about at the time. So I had and following the adventures of the UN Weapons Agency all through the 90s, called UNSCOM, UN Special Commission on Iraq, which was an initially supposed to be a very limited range project. When the first director was appointed, uh, a Swede named Rolf Achaeus, who had a very long, distinguished background in, if one can characterize it this way, the, the liberal politics of disarmament. And Achaeus expected to be there for perhaps six months, maybe 12 months, maybe 18, just to verify what Saddam was clearly going to do because he'd signed a paper saying he would. And it was a great surprise to Mrs. Achaeus, <laughs> to Rolf Achaeus, to everybody, that Saddam seemed to be so intractable, so committed to retaining WMD, um, so just rankly stubborn. When Iraq's power in the region, its once upon a time trajectory is an important player circa, say, 1980, before Saddam really took a hammer hold over the country. That all had rested on, Saddam, on, on, on the economic power of Iraq, on its relatively secular culture, on its keystone state position. None of it needed to be bolstered by WMD. So I think everybody who was originally committed to this 
project to show that you don't have to fight wars to a bloody conclusion, uh, and who was committed to powerful norms of disarmament, were in turn, was in turn committed to the success of UNSCOM. And how you overcome the will of a man who clearly enjoys playing hounds and hares, and clearly enjoys the game in part perhaps for his political prestige in the region. Um, what you do in that case was, was, was the dilemma. So for, for me personally, I won't say for the U.S. government, uh, the clearest theory always, and it wasn't a theory, it was, an, it was a uh, commitment, was Resolution 687, the mandated disarmament of Iraq as the only ultimately stable conclusion to, to the first Gulf War. And there are debates, clearly, uh, about what happens if you have a council resolution that's like law. Council resolutions are, are legal mandates. They're binding on every country in the world under Article 25 of the UN Charter. But what happens if you have one that's not enforced? Do you have to go to the council every time to seek a kind of spot market vote on enforcement? And if the Chinese are feeling grumpy that day because of something to do with Taiwan or uh, Guatemala recognized Taiwan, uh, or if the Chinese, if, if the French relationship for some period of time is not going well, does that mean that the council resolution stands hollow? Uh, or does anybody who was part of that original coalition have a right to depend upon the security condition that that resolution set forth. Now, if it was a boundary, if you had a country invading another country going over a territorial boundary, you'd say that the invaded country absolutely had a right to respond uh, without waiting for Security Council action, traditional self-defense, um, armed attack across a border, classic case. But why do you care about borders? You care about borders because they are essential to the security of the country that was invaded. And even if the border area is desert, you know, or mountaintops or something very remote where nobody lives, so who cares about a couple of hectares of acres of land? You care about it because it's a security guarantee. And so to in very many in a great many ways, these promises by Iraq were security guarantees that were as solemn as can be. Um, uh, in, in a way more solemn than treaties, because treaties can be withdrawn from ultimately, but the council resolution was mandatory. So I think the first and foremost theory, and it's not a theory, it was a ethical commitment by Iraq, was its frustration of the disarmament promises that had been made. And then there is, of course, uh, although it was not relied upon at the time because it's a, it's a developing norm, uh, but there is the kind of post-Kosovo argument and I wish I could go into it at some length if you want to. Well, uh, what I wanted to ask is uh, there seemed to be, uh, during the, the time period between August and, well, specifically after October of 2002 mm. and uh, leading up to the military uh, intervention on March 19th, there seemed to be uh, a confusion uh, within the media. Uh, specifically, can you speak to, was this an act of preemptive self-defense? No, absolutely not. I'm sorry, okay, so. Um, I mean, so just to just as stand sure. on its own. Yeah. The, the the irony, I suppose, of uh, the more histrionic readings of what was the Iraq uh, enforcement action is that uh, usually the U.S. is criticized for having too few legal theories. We're usually mute. We usually again treat it later in a common lawyer's fashion of many conditions, many hedges, many footnotes, many reservations. Coincidentally, post 9/11. Uh, the Bush administration had issued its white paper on preemptive self-defense, which was the argument that in an age of weapons of mass destruction, when there, you face adversaries where deterrence may not work, either because the leader is a lunatic or uncaring of his own people, or because it's, it's a non-state actor, that you'd have to begin to think about a right to proceed not simply against intention, but against capacity. It's not a new idea. I've always maintained in the classroom for years that uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, if you think about it, is a case of preemptive self-defense because we didn't suppose that Castro or the Soviets were about to launch missiles at us. But having nuclear weapons 90 miles off the shores of Florida, decreasing the launch time, uh, even though every country in the world, in principle, had a right to have nuclear weapons if it hadn't joined the NPT, the non 
the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Nonetheless, putting them there was so deeply destabilizing, uh, so deeply intimidating uh, that it couldn't be allowed to stand. And President Kennedy and, uh, put in place the embargo called a, quar called a uh, quarantine, to use more docile language, but it was an embargo, a blockade, uh, which in some other settings would have been called an act of war. Uh, and we got lucky, and both sides were sane, and the Soviet ships turned back, and it worked out fine. But that was a use of force against capacity. So it's, been, it's happened in the past. But in the case of Iraq, that stands quite separately. That is a case that really stems from, historically, in its uh, political drum roll to its denouement, from the flouting of Security Council resolutions by Iraq. And the Council has a right under the Charter to act against any threat to peace and security. Doesn't have to wait for a breach of the peace. Doesn't have to wait for an armed attack. Uh, the Council is uniquely endowed within the language of the Charter uh, with this right to act against a threat at a very early stage. So it was to make good on the Security Council resolution. Okay, and so in other words, Iraq was not a a act of preemptive self-defense and from the legal case that was... Well, I suppose if, if, I mean, if you held to a theory of... Lawyers have a way of saying, I have, I'm going to hold up my pants with belts, suspenders, garters, and paper clips. And if you held to a theory of preemptive self-defense, then you could use that theory as well. But even if you violently and vituperatively reject a theory of preemptive self-defense as being dangerous, uh, as being something we wouldn't want to see in the hands of other countries, so therefore why should we do it? Uh, even then, this case is different. This is, this is an old-fashioned case, to my mind, of making good on Security Council commitments. And to me, the lesson of the 90s, and this is something that transcends left and right and liberal and conservative, is that too often the Council has been feckless. Feckless in Bosnia, feckless in Rwanda, uh, make never makes good on its pledges or its mandates, makes promises it can't keep, uh, often beguiles people to relying upon it, as in the safe areas in Bosnia, and then leaves them like lambs to the slaughter, uh, that the UN's greatest problem has been a lack of credibility, that it means what it says. That when push comes to shove, it still seems to always prefer to suppose that rational Habermasian discourse can take care of every problem, and certainly that should be you know, used and explored. But in the real world, with a lot of societies that are uh, uh, self-selecting for thugs, um, that kind of rational action doesn't get you very far. So to my mind, this was about vindicating 687, vindicating the absolute conditions of the surcease of the original Gulf War. And when we spoke to uh, Sean Murphy of uh, George Washington University, mm -hmm. he argues that you have to look at both 678, 6, 86 and 687. So how do you take in consideration the provisions in 686? Well, the, 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 to, to, to lay people, this uh, flinging of resolutions often seems quite prolix and dense. Uh, I mean, six, we, we, originally when Saddam invaded Kuwait, uh, the council exhausted the idea of economic sanctions. It could have let the sanctions go on for another 12 years too, I suppose, to try to push Saddam out of Kuwait. But if you recall, Primakov visited with Saddam and gave him one last chance to withdraw. Um, and that was a moment, by the way, that proved to my mind that waiting is not always uh, cost-free because it was in that six-week period, eight-week period, uh, when Primakov visited that Unscom later discovered Saddam in that interval had weaponized his chemical and biological weapons. So sometimes waiting can kill people uh, and, and harm civilians. Um, when the war is fought to a effective conclusion on the highway of death, and Colin Powell decides he doesn't want to do it, the turkey shoot of, of, although frankly, I think many people wish that we had been more effective in disassembling the Republican Guard at the time we could, because they later were very, very brutal, as you know, to the Kurds in the north, again, and the Shia in the south, and uh, with our uh, misjudgment, I think, on the helicopters, where we let them retain the right to use helicopters, there was a second genocide uh, after the Gulf War, when, when Saddam really tried to just eviscerate his enemies. 
but uh, uh, the per 678 uh, um, authorizes the use of force uh, and uh, looks to the expulsion of Iraq from Kuwait and the restoration of peace and security in the region. And then 687 sets the particular conditions for uh, the ceasefire. Um, I mean, some people, will, I suppose, would give a particularistic reading to the use of force and say it was only about getting Iraq out of Kuwait. They're gone. No, so what if they threatened on the border again throughout the 90s? Still, they're gone from Kuwait. Um, but I think it's fair to say, kind of like a three-bite rule with a dog in the neighborhood, that the international community has a right to say that if you have a very bad history of action, if you've killed your Kurds in the north in a nice little genocide, and invaded Iran and invaded Kuwait, that we're going to set more stringent conditions on you than uh, have been set on other countries. And you have to do it reasonably. I mean, nobody wants to repeat the mistake of Versailles, where the Allies were essentially starving Germany and where it helped Hitler come to power. But it, I, to my mind, it is reasonable to have a kind of a proper name security politics, where you look at who's in power and what their, their, their default action has been in the past, and to put on this extraordinary disarmament regime, which was not at all separated from to my mind, Saddam's past ambitions to royal the region, to be the tough guy in the region, to intimidate his neighbors. Um, and the, the typical attitude in the region always was, if you talk to any experienced diplomat who's been around who talks to Arab leaders in private, it was, don't mess around with this guy. Don't do half measures. Don't leave us hanging as you did in 91. If you're going to go against him, you have to finish it. And until you do, we're going to you know, sit back and protect ourselves, uh, but uh, no, nobody ultimately thought he was an, a, a pan-Arabic champion of Islam or of Arabic, Arabic uh, politics or culture. And when we talk to Sean Murphy, yeah. he says that there's three big problems with the legal argument. Mm -hmm. One, that 686 in uh, paragraph, operative paragraph 4, saying that there are uh, eight measures that are explicitly constraining the use of force. And mm -hmm. then uh, 687 has an explicit authorization for the use of military force uh, or uh, explicit um, penalty for not complying the sanctions. And so the legal theory is de depending on all these implicit readings. And so when you look at, you know, how do you interpret resolutions? And what is the hierarchy? Is it first look at what's the written word? Second, do you look at what the debate is? Third, do you, you know, how, how do you determine what the truth is when you try to interpret these types of resolutions? Well, you have to read resolutions reasonably like you do any other legal document. Um, I mean, they, they are crafted in a very political environment. Nobody should ever have the illusion that the council is not political just because people use universalistic language, uh, which is one of the problems with ever relying on it as your, own, your sole security architecture. I mean, the rom romance of 1945 is gone. Um, was there a supposition that sanctions would be sufficient to... Uh, get Saddam to give up his weapons. Sure, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have the language in front of me, and I didn't, I wasn't aware before we filmed of Sean's specific argument here. But uh, was the hope that the onerousness of the sanctions would themselves be sufficient to gain Iraqi compliance? Of course, uh, that's why the sanctions have been kept in place at some considerable cost to the civilian population, because Saddam then used them as a weapon to say that it's the West who's starving you, not me. Um, and uh, one of the tragedies, frankly, of the uh, oil for food program has been that although it mitigated the harshness of the sanctions to some degree on uh, civilians, still it's huge leaking, which everybody now concedes was the case of billions of dollars, means that you really ultimately can't ever get through sanctions at what a state thinks is vital to its interest. Gary Huffbauer, who's an economist here in Washington, at the International Institute for Economics, um, has done a study of sanctions. And this has been the favorite you know, fallback policy tool of the UN community and originally of the League of Nations for decades now. Um, concerns always that under the law of war, sanctions often would be seen as an illicit instrument because they are pressuring the civilians to pressure the leader. And under the law of war, you can never target a civilian for his own sake, even to make him do something. So ironically, they're less discriminate than the use of kinetic gravity bombs, for example. Um, but the hope always was that sanctions would be coercive. Kaufbauer's work seems to show that sanctions sometimes work, but much slower than people suppose, and usually on uh, 
interests that states don't hold very dear. But if it's, if it's something a state really wants to accomplish, then their ability, capacity, commitment to resisting is quite considerable. So was there a, could, could you argue there was an implicit exhaustion requirement to try sanctions first? I suppose you could make the argument. It doesn't matter. So, I mean, this was a use of force that came about only after 12, 11 years of exhaustion uh, from 1991 onward. And frankly, some at least limited use of force was always part of it. In 1993, the French and the Brits and the Americans together uh, engaged in a, in, a, in a small use of force to uh, persuade Saddam that he had to allow the inspectors to have the use of an airfield that they needed for real-time inspections. Um, and in 1998, of course, when uh, Saddam uh, was going to expel the uh, inspectors and keep the Americans out and not allow inspection of the palaces, there was the very, very uh, concerted threat to use force in March of 98. Uh, there was a drum roll to that effect again in August 98, and ultimately there was the use of force in December 98 in Operation Desert Fox uh, when he effectively kicked the inspectors out. Um, so it's never been sanctions only. Um, and it, I think there's always, but there's always been the hope that fa sanctions would be, would be sufficient. I and mean, again, there, there is a debate, it's true, about whether it's not better practice to always hope for a multilateral uh, if I may call it, ins instantaneous permission to enforce. Who's, who's the policeman to enforce a resolution? Would we want uh, Suriname to suddenly announce it's invading Iraq to enforce Resolution 687? But in this case, uh, it was the U.S. and the Brits and a few other countries that provide the bulk of the fighting force. It was the Allies that, in fact, had a ground-level ceasefire before it was memorialized in 687. And they are, I think, entitled to rely on uh, the wording of 687, which is a solemn promise. Also, if you, I mean, if one wants to take an entirely, uh, I mean, I, I admire pacifists and their f philosophical commitments. I don't think they're well grounded in the real world. And if you wanted to be a pure pacifist, you'd have to then have abolished the no-fly zones as well, north and south, and said whatever happens to the Kurds in the north and the Shia in the south, is Saddam's problem, but, but clearly the status quo ante was not sustainable forever. We couldn't stay there forever drilling holes in the sky. And the moment we left, it was predicted by one and all that Saddam would again move in and finish off his domestic political opponents. Because I mean, the, the other theory that lurks behind that argument is that of humanitarian intervention. Now that is, uh, there's a wonderful phrase in international law, legge ferenda. Lex Verenda, law that's becoming, kind of soft norms becoming hard law. Um, it's the continuing tension in the UN Charter between the kind of procedural perfectionism, the procedural inclusiveness that you prefer to have, and the commitment of the Charter itself to certain substantive norms, one of which is human rights. So in the case of Kosovo, when you had the Security Council diagnosing the problem beforehand and finding that Slobodan Milosevic was using excessive force in regard to co the Kosovar Albanians, uh, calling on uh, Belgrade to allow substantial autonomy to Kosovo, um, but ultimately not wanting to use force, or at least to be the one to authorize force. And then thereafter, after the invasion, in, in a certain way ratifying the use of force, because Resolution 1244 then said, we forbid Belgrade from returning to Kosovo which is not the outcome you would ever have if it was a war of aggression by the Allies. Uh, this kind of sandwich where you have the council involved beforehand and afterwards, but not the ultimate middle of the sandwich, the use of force. Um, the countries that were involved with us in Kosovo were, in many cases, taken to the International Court of Justice by Yugoslavia, by Serbia, suing in the ICJ, the Civil World Court. And their defense often was humanitarian intervention, that uh, uh, you simply couldn't allow what they thought to be the case, that, that Milosevic was going to ethnically cleanse hundreds of thousands of people and kill tens of thousands. Let, let me just uh, interject mm. here just uh, mm. and, and ask a question about where does international law fall within the constraints of the uh, U.S. domestic law? Mm. Is the War Powers Act trump that? 
Um, you know, I've heard from some people that in some countries, international law is higher than domestic mm. law. In the United States, is it switched? And if so, how? Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a nettlesome semester long issue um, and varies country by country. I, I said on the UN. Well, just uh, just uh, sure. in that case, just focus on the United States. Sure. And, and is it true that uh, our domestic law, uh, in a way uh, that international law is seen is trumping or is just a statute or, or how well the, on, on the on the relationship between national law and international law there are two separate questions one is what is the kind of law that you could sue upon in a domestic court or that a government official would have to feel himself constrained by in a domestic setting and then there's a, there's a separate question what is the US bound to internationally you have the same country which is in, in a sense is at is involved in two different legal systems. It's like being a co-national. We're involved in the domestic legal system, we're involved in the international legal system. So in many regards, whether something is domestic law doesn't matter. We may still have an international obligation not to do it. And you will have debates about presidential versus congressional power, separation of powers. Could the president ever violate customary international law? The answer is probably yes. Some people will say no, but you in fact change customary law, which is made up from state practice, by pushing the edge of the envelope, uh, which oftentimes requires executive power. Uh, could, a, could a country, could a president ever breach a treaty? People breach treaties all the time, but there are consequences. You could be held to be in delict, a violator, financially responsible in the International Court of Justice, for example. Countries worry that if they behave as you know, scoff law way toward treaties or toward customary law, that tit for tat, they can't then claim the benefit of that same law which protects them. So without being able to go to court about it in a domestic setting, there still are powerful constraints that induce countries to uh, follow international law. But there's a big debate on the content of international law. Uh, and I, I, one should never suppose, I, I think, that because uh, a treaty is proposed, that the, the, the mere fact of its proposal makes it virtuous. I mean, there are bad statutes and bad bills as well. Congressmen can have bad ideas. So I wouldn't mistake the uh, aspiration of having a kind of Kantian universe where we all live in a reciprocal respect uh, with any kind of uh, lack of critical judgment about what the content is of a pr proposed norm. And, and put yourself in, in, a, in a journalist's shoes mm. for a moment. Imagine you're a television journalist mm. and you're trying to adjudicate the facts in a way or investigate uh, this debate that was happening mm. during the buildup to the mm. uh, military intervention in Iraq. Mm. There seemed to be a debate that the United States and United Kingdom were saying one thing and everyone else in the world is saying another thing. Is it possible for journalism to try to step in and say, we think that this side is right and this side is wrong. Well, it depends what kind of journalism you have in mind. I mean, the engage journalism, you know, the, there are different traditions in journalism. American journalism always tries to be up, quote, quote unquote objective and balanced and just the facts, ma'am. Um, the French have a much more passionate style of engage journalism. Um, so it depends what you're trying to do. Uh, I mean, how to make a judgment about what's going on is, 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 is I think, is the harder question. Um, a lot of the substance and the noise in current international law debates come from, I think, substantially different worldviews. Uh, without using any pejorative language or demeaning language, one can say that Europe uh, sees its own role now as fundamentally that of human security, by which they mean various humanitarian issues, such as child soldiers or landmines or uh, ecological issues um, does not see itself as having much of a role as an out-of-area enforcement policeman for international security. I mean, it's, it was a big debate whether the NATO could act out of area. It's taken a lot of uh, discussion, even on paper, to get the European Union to agree to a rapid reaction force. I mean, Europe has been quite inwardly focused for the last 50 years. Uh, very much involved in the project of constructing Europe. What does it mean to be a European citizen? The depth of integration. What about fiscal stability pact? And yes, the Brits still have some commitment to the Commonwealth, and the French have a commitment to West Africa, kind of post-colonial, uh, sentimental, or worse, ties 
Uh, but they don't see themselves as acting in Northeast Asia you know, with the Korean Peninsula problem or acting in the Taiwan Chinese confrontation, maybe the Middle East. But they do not see themselves, except through the Security Council, as having a fundamental commitment to global security in, in, in an old-fashioned balance of power, uh, deterrence, collective security sense. So I think you will get f some differences of view depending on how countries see themselves, how their publics see themselves, what they want to do. I'll give you one example. Mid-90s. Well, hold on. Uh, yes. my, the, the scope of my film yep. is going to be looking at Iraq. So no. the second half. But this, but this is a real parallel, uh, i.e. Uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone are falling apart in the mid-90s with terribly bloody wars. They would love the council to come in. Security Council. Security Council doesn't even want to pass a resolution about it. Why? Because if you pass a resolution, there's a subtle expectation you would act. Europe didn't want to act. So Africa did it on its own with a regional organization. You'll find that if people don't want to be involved in the project, they often tend to oppose the project. And, and there seems to be a, a politics of realism ap applied to the, the UN by, uh, it sounds like you've, you've used that term yourself and even Sean Murphy is uh, even if it, the political situations of, a, of, a, of any given situation, specifically with Iraq, is going to mm -hmm. dictate what actual the, the behavior is of all the different uh, players. And so it, specifically, I mean, if you look at the U.S. draft resolution that was uh, leaked to the New York Times, mm -hmm. and there's a, a, a 1441, and it says, and such breach authorizes member, member states to use all necessary means. Mm -hmm. They seem to explicitly say, okay, we're going to authorize individual member states to use all necessary means. And then throughout the process of that, that debate, it got an ambiguous result, such that uh, going back to Article you know, 2, Paragraph 4, it seems that of the, of the Charter of the UN, it looks like that the UN was trying to say that only the United Nations Security Council should be enforcing these resolutions and not any individual member state. If you look at the debate on 1441, it, it ended up as a standoff. The French perm rep, the ambassador in New York, said there's no autom automaticity to the use of force from this resolution, this last chance uh, resolution. The U.S. said there's no prejudice to our prior existing rights from this resolution. So neither side got quite what it wanted. Um, but it was made plain to Saddam Hussein that this was the last chance. This is the dry gulch, you know, uh, ultimatum by the sheriff. This is the last chance you have. And on whether that resolution added to previously existing rights to enforce through either unilateral or coalitions of the willing uh, action. Uh, I think the French perm rep said it didn't. The U.S. said that it, it, it certainly didn't degrade their prior existing rights. I've always thought 687 was the uh, cleaner theory, uh, tout seul, that uh, we were trying to be, I think, solicitous and to show that we took the U.N. seriously. But there's an old lawyer's adage, a trial lawyer's adage, you know, of, kind of Irving Younger's rules for cross-examination of a witness. Don't ask a question if you're not going to like the answer, uh, or even if you don't know the answer. Uh, and in, in NATO relationships in prior escapades, you had always heard the political saw that the French may be resistant, but in the ultimate end, they will come f on board. And I do think that it was quite a shock to the U.S. to discover that, I mean, even now, even when it comes to training police forces for post-war Iraq in country, uh, Jacques Chirac is still not willing to sign on. Uh, so the old just-in-time French arrival uh, rule of the road is, is, is dead and buried for the moment. I mean, the council works only as well as the politics and the alliance of its members. And it had its first crisis, as you know, after the, co after the Cold War broke out. And the assumption that the Big Five were going to be pals forever was in disarray. Uh, that's when you saw Dean Acheson go to the General Assembly to get a second resolution for Korea to, to authorize the uh, uh, fight against North Korea. Um, so the council works as well or as ill as the relationship among the P5, China, Russia, France, uh, Britain, and America. And will, will we sometimes not take action because we hope for uh, council Concurrence? Absolutely. But push come to shove. And Kofi Annan said this himself. Uh, he wrote, he read, gave a very beautiful speech in September of 99 on legitimacy and uh, 
and intervention, sovereignty and intervention, in which he put the hypothetical of Rwanda all over again and said, if you had some country that was willing to go into Rwanda by itself or with a few friends uh, to prevent the genocide, interrupt the genocide, even if you could not get a council resolution, would you have wanted that country to stand back? He didn't answer his own question, but the answer hanging in the air was, of course not. So this tension between your preferred procedures and the rock bottom necessary result um, is one that's inherent in the charter, inherent in the imperfection of a post-Cold War political system. But it's not the creation of the U.S. I mean, I, I mean the one thing I think about hyperpuissance, hyperpower, which is you know, the favorite French term of obloquy, is that it, it, it's, it's a signal rather simply that World War II is not over. If you look at the relative economic size of countries in the world, the two other countries that should be providing major stanchions, major you know, keystone architecture for regional security is Germany and Japan. Japan has had a uh, GDP that's uh, as high as 20% of the world. We have 25, 27, 30%. Germany has 8, 9%, 10%, uh, numbers 2 and 3, Japan and Germany. And yet, for historical reasons, because their neighbors aren't quite comfortable with them yet, they're not quite comfortable with themselves yet, they can't take the role that their economies would otherwise prescribe for them. So this kind of vacuum of power is one that really, ironically, is still the aftermath of World War II. I think we, we've talked to Reed Brody of Human Rights Watch. Mm. And he says that you shouldn't consider a rocky humanitarian intervention because the, the legal case was never it was never sold to the UN as a, a humanitarian intervention. No one ever tried to claim that there was an image genocide, and no one uh, provided the, 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 the MSI? A genocide oh. that there was an imminent genocide or ongoing mm -hmm. to justify. So when you when you make analogies to Rwanda or Kosovo, this is different because no one actually tried to argue that there was an imminent genocide that needed to be stopped. Well, define imminent genocide. I mean, there's there's still debates about about whether Operation Horseshoe by Slobodan Milosevic was real or imagined. Um, clearly, Milosevic was willing, ultimately, in the course of the Kosovo intervention, to push over the border. What more than 500,000 people into countries that would be destabilized by them, countries that couldn't handle them, and a kind of a demographic, demographic engineering project that you haven't seen since World War II and Stalin. Um, and but in a case of Iraq, though, when you're looking at Iraq as a case study, which mm. is what my film is ultimately, mm. looking at Iraq mm. and looking at it, did anyone, to your knowledge, try to, to at least provide any evidence or uh, to claim this legally as a humanitarian. Well, again, there's, there's no single forum in which you claim things in the international community. It's kind of an ongoing conversation with lots of fora. Uh, clearly, in the Anfal gas campaign uh, in Fallujah, uh, Saddam willingly used weapons of mass destruction to quell the Kurdish villagers. Uh, clearly, Saddam was not happy that with the no fly zone, Kurdistan, so to say, uh, the, the Kurdish autonomous functionally autonomous region, was, a, was standing outside of his power uh, wingspan. Uh, it, the moment we withdrew, if we stopped the no-fly zone, I don't think anybody would argue that Saddam was, would have stood pat. He would have been back in there with troops and helicopters and every weapon he chose to use. So to find genocide, if it, can, you, can you intervene only at the instant it breaks out? I mean, one of the arguments that's given for why we couldn't have intervened in Rwanda a colleague of mine at Johns Hopkins has made this argument, I'm not sure I agree with it, is that the logistical capability to intervene in areas that are not literal areas, you know, right next to the seaside, is, is difficult. It takes time, and tip fids, time phase deployment programs. Um, it takes a, quite a while to muster a force that's an effective fighting force, particularly with force protection. So you, you can't wait until genocide minus one to get in there if you're going to stop something. If somebody has made it plain to you on repeated occasions that he is determined to uh, just eviscerate variant communities, as Saddam did after the first Gulf War, when he drained the marshes and killed tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of Marsh Shia, and his campaign against the Kurds with helicopters after the first Gulf War, 
when we foolishly let him go up there with helicopters. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind, and I don't think it would, would be in Reed's mind, that his ultimate intention was not to form a consociational pluralist dictatorship, but rather to crush these communities. So you, you, you can't wait until the moment of launch of the genocide to go in. The fact that you didn't make the argument in a particular forum, this is a norm that's evolving. Indeed, people are wary of the norm because could any neighbor inv in in invade any other neighbor? People have both good and bad feelings about Vietnam invading Cambodia. It displaced Pol Pot, but it brought you a Vietnam communist regime. T Tanzania into Uganda. Uh, um, India into Bangladesh, into East Pakistan. Uh, there's a lot of instances where what could be styled as humanitarian intervention has also been disputed. So it's a norm that people feel a moral attraction to, but also want to keep in a box. So it's not used fecklessly in, in, in inappropriate circumstances. But it, it, but it is one, frankly, in Europe with an agenda of, of human security, uh, a human rights agenda, and here too that people feel some commitment toward. You, you'll find former pe people who were formerly very uh, skeptical of the use of force, like David Reif, who's a writer for The New Yorker, or William Sharcross, who was a huge critic of our Cambodia bombing, who are now liberal hawks, who say, you have a, not just a right, but a duty to intervene to prevent gross human rights violations. And nobody can argue that Saddam was not that. I, I think that's... That's that's clear, but when we look at the uh, case that we look uh, that was presented to the UN, the U.S. legal theory was very complex. It was implicit and not explicit, and the majority of the international community, not just France, but a General Assembly, but also the United Nations Security Council, was clearly against a wholesale invasion to topple the the government of Saddam, which is not within the proportionality of enforcing the constraints set forth in six eight seven. So it seems like there's a lot of issues that were coming up about this legal argument. You're mixing up a lot of things in your question. Uh, clearly against disproportionate. I mean, there's a rule in international law that the means you use should be proportionate to the military mission that you have put forward to, your, to, to accomplish. Right, and the point is that uh, toppling the, the government of Saddam Hussein is mm -hmm. disproportionate to the provisions set forth in 687. Disproportionate. The, well, if you've tried for 12 years to persuade Saddam Hussein to abide by 687, if you've tried to coerce him to abide by 687, if he's cheating hand over fist on the sanctions, which was clear even before oil for food blew up, everybody knew he was smuggling oil through Turkey and through Iran and through Jordan um, and harvesting at least several billion dollars a year. If you have no other method of coercion, are you ultimately permitted to coerce a regime in the, if you are, are you allowed to complete the first Gulf War, essentially? Is it toppling a regime or is it enforcing a mandate? They sometimes are the same thing. If in the case of Noriega, for example, uh, when he stole the election, OAS certified that he did, um, was it right or wrong to go in? You can debate about it, but it was clear that Noriega was never going to conduct himself in a more Composed democratic fashion. If you look at the debates that were around 678 and 687 and 686 even, the debates of the, the international norm was that this does not, they, they, they used explicit language in they, they, the United the, Nations. The, the United, the United, United Nations. Nations Security Council. There you know, are 15 countries on yeah, the United Nations Security they used, Council. In 687 they, they voted on it and they used explicit language to continue the authorization of force. They didn't do that in 687. They could have. They knew very well how to do it and they didn't. They knew very well. The, the United how Nations to do Security it. Council knew how. Six seventy eight was an authorization for the use of. I mean, I, I don't. I don't want to sit here doing a you know a, a, a rédaction de texte like tenth grade French class, uh, but choosing council resolutions. Six seventy eight was an authorization for the use of force to uh, dispel the Iraq out of Kuwait, not to and invade, to restore and to restore, restore peace. Restore, but not establish. Oh, gee whiz, you have not been to law school for quite long enough yet, my, my, my friend. Uh, this is the words of Sean Murphy. Huh? Well, and I like and I respect Sean, but lawyers can also have different different uh, points of view. It, it, the, the, but the, all subsequent relevant resolutions, did that go from 660 to 1441 or 660 to 687? Did what go? The, the authorization to enforce the, the, the languages, use all necessary means to enforce... 
660 and all subsequent relevant revolu resolutions. Mm -hmm. Is 687 it, relevant? Well, the is, issue is... Is it subsequent? That's the point. It, it was, is 687. It, it seems to me are both subsequent and relevant. What about 1441? What about it? Is that it, if you look at the preamble of 678, it seems that the subsequent relevant revolution, resolutions are pointing to those those resolutions in the preamble, not necessarily a resolution. It goes to... This is going to be absolutely incomprehensible to your viewing public. They do not have the text of these things before you. All I can say to make it clean and plain is the, that um, the expectation was in March of 1991 that Saddam would promptly comply with the conditions of 687. It was fresh then. I mean, it's true. There is in international law, as in contract law, normal life, an idea of desuetude. If, if you had, uh, if you and I had a business partnership and you walked away from it or I walked away from it and I waited 35 years and then I came back at you and said, what about that uh, candy store you promised to establish with me? That if you sit on your rights for too long, something can become stale. I mean, if you had an antique, ancient resolution from 1963 that you had never acted upon, you had never freshened, you had never referred to, uh, then can you suddenly, 40 years later, invoke it? I would be skeptical. I'd give advice against it. But this has been the, the major, on, one of the few major ongoing projects of the Council continually for the last 12 years. And it, it, was, not, it was not anything that was antique, forgotten, fallen into disrepute, disarray, desuetude. It was a live and active project. It had seen three directors. It had seen Rolf Achaeus. It had seen Richard Butler. Uh, it had seen Kofi Annan's mission to Baghdad in March of 98, where Saddam Hussein wouldn't even see him. Why should a head of state bother to see the head of the United Nations? Kofi Annan had graciously said, I think I can do business with this man, had entered into a memorandum of understanding, which Saddam promptly uh, disregarded. Uh, there, people had so, f so exhaustively uh, explored avenues of good faith that there was nothing left to explore. I mean, one could argue, why did we invade in 2002 instead of 1998? That's a fair argument. I think in December of 1998, it was rather sad that all that the Allies mustered was a kind of symbolic pinprick gesture uh, that did not make Iraq take this seriously. And then Iraq had four years to regroup when we didn't know what was happening, made the war much more dangerous for the Allies. Uh, that whole period when one didn't know what they were doing. Uh, and 2002, in, in every, uh, I'm sorry, 2003, I'm looking at my years. Uh, but the, the debate that began in 2002, culminating March 2003, was really the last chance, I think, to um, make good on 687. And yes, there are voices in Washington here, for example, my friend Jessica Matthews of Carnegie, who say, why couldn't you have continued a regime of coercive inspections? It put 100,000 troops at the four corners of Iraq, and if they don't let you into a particular building, then you go in and pulverize that building. A couple problems with that. Number one is, at the time, I think, the hope was we wouldn't have to stay in the region that long. Number two, the lesson of peacekeeping is you can't mix peace enforcement, robust action, and more pacific action. Uh, Milosevic took hostages willy-nilly in Serbia. Saddam had taken hostages in the first Gulf War. So he couldn't expose people to have them go back and do a, a yes, please, may I, mother, uh, inspection of buildings at the same time that you were bombing the regime. And everybody, I think, soup to nuts, left to right, concedes that Saddam was not going to move except in the face of actual military power. Uh, he was not offering to open up the palaces until we flowed troops into the region. And, and Michael Hanlon said that you would need about 75,000 troops to, uh, you know, it's not a hard and fast number, but approximately 75,000 troops to enforce, uh, you know, a persuasive uh, compliance with the resolutions. But it, How does he make that judgment? I mean, he didn't, I mean, but there, there, there is a threshold. Shin, Shinseki's half a million or Hanlon's 75,000? I mean, this, but it, it seems like there seemed to point... Be there's a point air power where the, and there's ground power. Where the... United States military and the U.S. media saw the force that was there originally intended to enforce uh, compliance, but eventually that turned into a, a force for invasion. And there's a perception sh shift there. 
So, and you've said even in your articles, you can't mm. leave the troops there forever. Why not? They can't leave them forever. I mean, I, I as everyone else, is unhappily uh, uh, educated as to how long we're having to leave them there now. But uh, to be sure, ex ante, I think the hope was that you could topple the regime, get a replacement, and get out quicker than we have. I mean, one of the problems looking at it before the invasion was that Kim Jong Il, who's you know nobody's Sigma Chi sweetheart, uh, was pretty clearly using the occasion of our being tied down in Iraq as a nice opportunity to just to disregard the NPT and to uh, break open the seals on his his fuel rods and tell the uh, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, to take a hike. And the concern is if you're tied down one place, it, it gives great opportunities for folks in other places. I mean, to my mind, uh, and I didn't, I, I, you should have talked to me in 1991 or 92, but uh, I was an absolute solid democratic liberal uh, who, who became somewhat dis pointed by UN failures to perform uh, in Bosnia, Rwanda, elsewhere. Um, but to my mind, this, this is not a Cold War project. This is not a right-left project. This is a project about giving credence to UN Security Council resolutions. And yes, anybody who spent any time in New York, and everybody who writes about the UN should, should spend time there. You, it, it's, it's not done by deductive logic. I mean, the politics are thick and furious. And you hope for a good outcome. You hope for some kind of you know, balancing of partialities. That's why you have a collective organ in the first place. Uh, and you want to keep uh, disputes from escalating in dangerous ways. But don't watch, don't, don't watch sausage being made. You know, military guys used to come to me in the days of Rwanda, Bosnia, elsewhere. And I'd be doing a little teaching here and there and say, we shouldn't have to have an unclear mandate in countries Mil militaries from every country would say that. We hate these mandates that are unclear. Did and I would say, you know, li learn to live with it. The council's always going to give you a muddle. Did the U.S. have explicit authorization to, u to act as an individual member state to enforce these resolutions? Explicit authorization from whom? From the United States, from the United Nations Security Council. You're going to have to go to a lawyer and get your, get, get, and, and harvest opinions. In my view, it was a reasonable action to say that the 687 conditions were security conditions, just like borders are security conditions, that you're entitled to rely upon, that come to have a, an objective circumstance. And if someone invades my country, I don't have to ask the permission of Iceland to respond to it. And so, too, if I... Would, would, would you dispute that if Kuwait was invaded again, Kuwait could respond? Uh, if, if Saddam... That's Article 51, though. This is a little bit different. Well, no, that, Article 51 talks about like, armed attacks. Right. Uh, if, so if they're armed attack by Iraq, they have the mm -hmm. right to respond. Mm -hmm. That's different than uh, what we did, which was we weren't attacked by Iraq. We never submitted to, under the Article 51 obligations, to there's say another, we're acting this. There's another large... This. I mean, I mean, there's a, we did it under United Nations Security Council resolutions, and we hold it up. The normative standard of the international community seem to be saying that this that we do not buy your legal argument. That's what that's the what normative France standard and, of the international community. Right. This is outside of the normative, you know, the, the, the normative operations of the United Nations. This is outside of that. Would you say that this is normal operations to say that we have there? There's no Ven, there's no Charlie McCarthy at the UN who speaks for the United Nations. You have countries taking positions. The countries that went with us into Iraq and the second Gulf War clearly thought they were under sufficient legal umbrella to do so. The people differed on it. People do have you know, sincere and passionate points of view. It's true. I happened to be in London during the Million Mum March. Stand. I was trying to get to a concert in the South Bank and I had to get across the parade of the Million Mums. And they weren't all tro Trotskyites. There were a lot of middle class folks there. I indeed understand the depth of feeling that Britain had about that. One thing that some people explained to me is that uh, if you live in a country that formerly was colonial, as England, as France, and that had to give up its empire out of sheer fatigue because after World War II, Europe was exhausted, so that the Brits got out of India and out of Cyprus and a bunch of other places much faster than they probably should have, leaving these countries in a lurch. But that to them, Iraq, I think, may have seemed the reopening of the kind of burden that they hoped to be rid of while they were busy building Europe. Uh, but, but you can't, don't be so naive as to suppose that people reason about the law only in some kind of 
Aristotelian deductive way. You know, Oliver Wendell Holmes is famous for having said the life of the law is, is experience, not logic. And reasons the countries vote against things depend on how they see their own role, what they want to have happen. I would not be so cynical as to suppose, except maybe I might, uh, that countries' commercial ties can influence their votes, who they're friends with influence their votes. Some subjects never come up at the UN. Kashmir almost never comes up. Why? India is a big power at the UN. Chechnya never comes up. Tibet never comes up. The choice of topics and what you do about them is often intensely political. Israel comes up every time because like the old Tom Lehrer song, that wonderful MIT mathematician, uh, it seems to be uh, everybody's favorite uh, kick the can, kick, kick the Zionist entity. Uh, it's, it's, it's the one uh, hatred that many countries seem to be able to agree upon, so Israel always tops the list. Uh, don't suppose this is some clinical exercise. I mean, some of the organs you have the deepest aspirations for, the UN Human Rights Commission, end up being vulgar res World Wrestling Federation mud-throwing matches on who is named and who is not. The 1503 Committee, to name who is guilty of systematic and gross violations, tends to attract the bad boys because they want to filter which countries are going to be named. Uh, if you go in there with your UNICEF you know, milk carton to collect coins and think that's the way you can play the game, the ethical game at the UN, you will be quickly disabused. And from your uh, standpoint, I've, I've been running into a lot of brick walls of people saying international law is not important. Like, why are you doing this? You know, why are you focusing on oh. these angles? You know, what what would your response be to those people or people like why is international law important? Well, I, I guess the, 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 my metier, if, if you will, is a kind of realist international law. Uh, it's to say to the international lawyers, don't craft a regime that is so uh, aspirational, so uh, romantic, so naive, uh, that it, you make rules or norms or procedures that no one can live by. Uh, remember the Holocaust, remember every other terrible event of recent world history, and understand that the object is to prevent these things, not simply to have a kind of procedural perfectionism. Um, so my, 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 I guess my preachment to my international lawyer friends is, if people aren't listening to you, figure out why. Is it because you have nothing that they can use? I mean, a, a good lawyer wants to help the client do what's right, and a good lawyer will often preach to the client but we'll also try to help the client do it in the right way. Uh, but to the folks who are pure realpolitik, no, of course we have an interest in maintaining a structure of law. I spend now nine weeks a year of my life at no pay on the UN Human Rights Committee. And what we do is engage with country delegations to argue with them about how they've implemented the covenant on civil and political rights, to give it meat and to say, look, uh, female genital mutilation in Central African Republic is not a very, is not easily consistent with uh, the rights of equality under Article 26. Uh, it's 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 somewhat political, somewhat legal. It's very engaged. It's very immediate. Uh, it may have limited limited efficacy, but it gives reformist elements in those countries something to take home to their capitals to, with which to argue for domestic change. Um, so do I think it's the stuff worth doing? You betcha. Uh, the U.S. throughout most of its history has been a neutral country, a smaller country, deeply interested in maritime rights, the right to trade on the high seas. And we've always argued for a thick regime of international law. But I do think that as international law gets more ambitious, where it's trying to enter areas it's never entered before, it's, it's coming up against some brick walls. One is the problem of federalism that in fact most countries that have federal structures like Australia, Canada, US, Germany, others can't force their states to take certain actions. They're subnational entities. So there's actually ironically a kind of at the moment a kind of Einsteinian limit on how much compliance can be compelled by the national capital. Uh, and if you try to take over all of international of all of domestic governance with international norms, you get some understandable resistance that people like to do it their way, that there should be some margin for local taste, not grotesque things, but what the Europeans call a margin of appreciation. You may come to understand that the rest of the world doesn't want to be as deeply integrated as Europe is. When it comes to war and peace and norms about how and when you use force, I just, I would remind people of World War II and where the phrase United Nations 
first came from. It was not the building. It was not the charter. It was the anti-fascist alliance. And it was a moniker that was invoked by Roosevelt to urge his allies not to seek a separate peace. And the premise was that you would have to have an effective collective security arrangement. Now the one, I think the one fallacy that lawyers can fall into is the old high school logic teacher, post hoc propter hoc hoc. It happened after something, so it was caused by something. You have simultaneously had the security promises of Chapter 7 of the UN Charter coexisting alongside of balance of power politics, uh, nuclear deterrence, you know, mutually assured destructive capability, all the things that more or less maintain stability in the Cold War. One can't assume it was the Security Council alone with its law that was what kept the international system more or less in check. And I think international lawyers can't fall into the logical fallacy of supposing that it has been only the law that has done all this, at the same time as they should recognize and salute and uh, and uh, cultivate uh, the constructivist norms that make countries want to be seen as legitimate actors. Okay, let me just sit for a few seconds. <laughs>